What's up, everybody? This is Mike Whitmire, co-founder, CEO of Flowcast, proudly an inactive CPA. Welcome to Blood, Sweat, and Balance Sheets, the podcast where we aim to give accountants uh, career advice, whether that's in the finance, entrepreneurship world, or in other areas. Today's guest is Alan Solomon. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. He has a long and storied career. You will hear quite a few stories along the way that are amazing. Start as an accountant, shifted into the legal world, and then help build up casinos across the country. Really hope you enjoy the, the episode. I know I did. Previously on Blood, Sweat, and Balance Sheets. One of the persons I met was Arthur Goldberg, who was president of the time of Hilton Gaiman. And I found out that, that Hilton had to sell the property in the casino. And I called them and I said, Arthur, I said, you know, this would be a great, Isle. oh, we changed the name to Isle of Capri Casinos. Okay. Uh, just a, another story. But, but anyway, um, Arthur said, Alan, uh, I'd be happy to talk with you about it, but I have it sold. He said, who are you selling it to? He said, Donald Trump. So I said, Donald, Donald. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I said, what's he buying it? He told me the price. And I said, Arthur, we would pay more for it than that. He said, look, I got it sold. To Don I said, will you, if Donald can't buy it, will you sell it to us? He said, let me think about that. He says, but why won't Donald buy it? I said, I don't know. I said, things happen. Turns out Donald didn't buy it. And so I called him. I, I heard it on the street. So okay. I, I said, Arthur, Donald's not buying it. Do you know what happened? Do you know why he couldn't? He didn't buy it? Yeah, but uh, you'll have to ask him. Oh, hold. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I said, uh, certainly not on a, a podcast. For sure. Uh, then, so I said, um, he said, Alan, he said, uh, I never said I'd sell it to you. I said, I know, but, 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 but we're good. You know, we'd like to buy it. He said, I got it resold. So I, I said, really, who's buying it? He said, Stations Casino. Stations Casino is a major uh, riverboat company, the largest company in, in, in Missouri. And uh, at the time, and had properties in Vegas and other okay. things. Uh, and I said, uh, what, uh, uh, what are they paying? And he told me. So I said, we, we would pay more than that. You keep offering more. Why weren't you the first call? Because what can I tell you? And, and so, so he, so I said, will you sell it to us? Um, uh, if stations doesn't buy it, he said, stations, Allen's the largest company in Missouri. They're licensed. He said, I don't have to go through any licensing problems with them. Uh, he said, you're not licensed in Missouri. I said, no, we aren't, but we've been licensed in Louisiana and other states. We can get licensed. Yeah. He said, uh, no. He said, no, I, I have a deal that will be quickly move. I said, well, if, if Stations doesn't buy it, will you sell it to us? And he asked again, why won't Stations buy it? I said, I don't know, but will they? And he said, Alan, I will. If you if you, uh, if stations doesn't buy it, I'll sell it to you, but I, but I, I won't set the price at this point. Okay. So I said, that's okay. So stations, and this was public, got into trouble in Missouri because of uh, indirect contacts uh, between the employees or the senior management of stations so some so some regulatory things came up in licensing. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. it, oh, and stations had to sell their 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 casinos. Oh yeah. my gosh, it was that bad! Wow. Yeah. Oh, the, the the state is very strict. In turn, it, it, depending on the state, Missouri is is very strict. Okay. Oh, so Arthur called me, and he said, "Well, stations isn't buying it, Alan. Uh, you're up in." And he gave me the price, and I said, "Okay." Wow, and he said, he, he said you got to promise me that that you think you can get licensed. So I said, I think we can get licensed. Yeah, that's that's what you do, right? That's yeah. exactly what we did, and we ended up buying it. And the company still owns it today, and it's been a very successful company. Wow, very successful property. That's it's an amazing a, story. Yeah, 
incidentally, at the same time, we had an arrangement. Uh, uh, Marvin Davis had been licensed. He's an entrepreneur or was in California and Colorado, didn't know much about gaming. Uh, but he had been awarded a license in Missouri in Boonville. And he had to build the boat. And I got a call a couple months later. They said, Marvin, not from them, but from one of the uh, inter intermediaries. Marvin doesn't know what he's doing. He really needs a partner in this deal. Would you guys consider coming in? So I said, yeah. I said, well, look, uh, I I'm going to look at anything. Sure. So it turned out uh, that I met with Marvin. He's building the boat. We didn't see eye to eye. I said, look, I'm not going to be your partner. If you wanted to, we'll take over the situation. And he did. He, he let us, step. he was totally out of the picture. Oh. And we took over the situation, built the boat in Boonville, and the company still owns it. And that's been a successful uh, property as well. So if you fast forward to, to, I mean, today, how how big is this organization now? You guys have been acquiring well, all kinds of businesses. They, well, it, it's owned today by Seasons. Okay. Words, when I retired and Bernie Goldstein passed away at that time, uh, we, we brought in other management. I said, I had had enough of it. Uh, I was, I wanted to travel. I wanted to be with the family. Uh, I just didn't need uh, to, I didn't need to continue. Yeah. So I retired and today um, it's gone through several sales and that kind of thing. But you know, we have over, I think maybe 12, 13,000 employees. Wow. Uh, you know, or a lot of revenue uh, always, always still did well. But the company today, uh, as I said, is part of Caesars. I want to tell you another story about Caesars. Oh, oh yeah, for sure. Okay, so uh, at all these parties or meetings, whatever you do, and you drink with guys from other companies, I you know, made it my business to become friendly with other guys in the development or owners or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I got a call from Caesars, uh, and he said, Alan, I got just the property for you. I said, what's that? He said, in, in, in Colorado, in Blackhawk, Colorado, um, they're, they have a few casinos and Caesars has a license and has a site. So I said, okay. He said, and we were going to develop it, but the board decided that since you could only bet $5 in, in Colorado, that it wasn't a Caesars property. He said, there's a joint venture. You have to work out a deal with the joint venture guy. He said, but the prices, we would sell our position for $7 million. So I said, so what do we get for our position? He said, well, you get the casino site and you um, also uh, get our interest in the joint venture. And, and I'm sure you can manage the joint venture. So you'll get a, a fee for that. He said, can you come and look at the property for me? So I said, sure. So uh, at the time I had a daughter who lived in Denver and some grandkids. So I, I, got, I, I said to Bernie Goldstein, I'm going out to Colorado. He says, we don't, what do we want to do in Colorado? I said, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> worth it, a look. It's worth a look. So I went out there and uh, with the guy from Caesars and um, I, I'm at a site. I said, where's the casino? Where's the site? He said, here it is. I said, that's a mountain. He said, Alan, you have to take out like 300 thousand tons or whatever it is of rock what I said, what i That's said an... you 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 got and you put the casino there i said you you got to be kidding <laughs> i said what's that gonna cost he said i don't know he said we got some basic estimates around eight or nine million to oh, take it so i said yeah but how about from an epa standpoint and you know what's in the he says, Alan, you, you would be at risk on that. So I, I, I went in, I met with the other joint venture partner and he was willing to have us come in uh, if we bought out Caesars and gave us a management agreement. And then I went to find the money. And at that time we were, we had plenty of borrowings and we were pretty well strapped. So I went to Jeffries and Company 
Okay. Uh, in California, and uh, I explained to them the deal, and they thought they could do a a a a one one site financing for us. So we did a seventy five million dollar financing. Uh, we uh, uh, we had to put ten million of that in reserve to take case, you know, depending upon what it was. Did not guarantee it. And it's been one of the most successful casinos that we had. Wow, because for 75 million, I mean, you only needed 7 million to cover the cost of your portion, right? So it was the, the rest was leveraged to develop the site and remove the 3,000 pounds of rock, or 3,000 tons of rock that had to come out? Well, yeah, mountain rock, yeah. And anyway, it worked out. And, and, and since then, we, uh, we, we built a hotel there and we actually bought Colorado Central Stations which is located across the street. And we built the hotel there also. It's been a very, and Colorado has changed their rules. So, so you can bet more than $5. More than $5. Yeah, that is a limiting factor for a casino, only having $5. It is for, for table games, for slot machines. Not too many people bet more than $5. That makes sense. Okay, so that's the business pivot you make is let's focus more on slot machines. The whole regional gaming other than in Las Vegas or in Atlantic City is slot machines. Yeah. Mm. I mean, over 90% of our revenues were in our from, from slot machines. I had, a, I had a funny story with a uh, gentleman who was running a Native American reservation. I'm curious if you had any involvement in that, that world, but his company built slot machines and we we're talking about buying our software. And he goes, you know, I'm interested in buying it, but if I see you guys at one of those slot machines, I'm going to lose respect for you and I'm not going to buy your software. And he's like, you're just handing us money if you do that. I thought that was a fascinating thing to hear from the CFO of a slot game company. When the DeBartolos were still partners of us, uh, Eddie DeBartolo Jr. Um, owned the San Francisco 49ers. I was going to say, yeah, we should clarify for the audience. He ended up being the owner of the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. He always was. No, well, our deal was with Eddie DeBartolo Sr., Okay. His father. And his father and Eddie DeBartolo had said to me, Alan, I can't get too close to you uh, because uh, I own the 49ers and they wouldn't be interested in, in having a casino company, you know, be a part of whatever it is in the San Francisco 49. After, okay. we, had, after we had bought out their interests, Eddie DeBartolo Jr. called me. He said, Alan, I got this great deal out here. So I said, okay, you know, what's the deal? Yeah, he explains it to me. He said, and they want a half a million dollars of good faith money put up. Uh, and then they'll deal with us. What's good faith money? So I said, what is good faith money? He said, <laughs> you, you write them a check. He said, I'm willing to put up $250,000. I said, why, why should we put up that money? He said, Alan, if I'm putting it up, I would think you would, we, we've had a relationship. Uh, I would think, and it's in the San Francisco area. It's right there. And, and we're giving them seats to the 49ers games and all that kind of stuff. So I got this, the chief on the phone. Okay. Uh, and I had a very bad feeling. And I said to Bernie, I said, you know, I'm not sure we want to do that. And at the time we had some money and we discussed it, we decided if Eddie was putting up 250, we would put up 250. Okay. So we did, you know, the letter and here's a gift or whatever it was. Two days later, I get a call from a guy from California after we paid the money. He said, I'm the chief. You paid the money to the wrong person. Uh, so I said, okay. I said, Eddie, I said, well, oh, I don't know. Anything. That was it. So, so that was our experience, uh, in, in, in Native American gaming. Okay. Okay. So, so <laughs> that wraps up that story. Wow. Yeah. The, was it like cash? Was it literally cash? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. We, we didn't deal with cash. Seriously, from a from a, a regulatory standpoint, everything was done. 
totally above board. Okay. Not only other things, but if you ever got into trouble in jurisdictions, one jurisdiction, that's the end of your participation in the gaming business. So is the you know reality of gaming business way more above board than what movies and uh, historical lore would lead you to believe? Absolutely. In the, okay. The, when I got first examined in Bernie, they came and spent two weeks in, um, in Boca examining me, going around talking to people, reviewing all my five-year tax returns, all of Bernie's stuff was much more complicated than mine. But it, it, it yeah, it, it, it totally above board. Okay. I don't know any situation. It, it, I, and not only that, but we're tightly regulated. One of the times I was in Missouri, um, uh, it, in, in underage girl had been caught gaming uh, at the tables. And they brought up the question of a fine. And they find the commission vote. I was at the commission meeting. It wasn't our uh, casino. <laughs> and, oh, and it's, it's self-reporting. So, I mean, you, you, you have to report it. Mm -hmm. And it was reported, and they find uh, the casino $250,000. Wow. For it, but, right. And so um, I said to the guy, boy, I said, uh, that's really something. He said they were in your casino too, but you guys didn't report it. Oh, <laughs> how do you? I mean, I guess you're checking IDs and everything, but it's a lot to lot to track. Is still, and you have a. Mm -hmm. We we actually require identification, but we put it. it uh, you have to be at least twenty seven or twenty eight years old in, in order to. Oh, do that. I didn't realize it was that age. Okay. You don't have to, it's 21, but we don't take, uh, we uh, have a lot of uh, participants, players who don't uh, show their age or, or they look older than they really are. Mm -hmm. And in Lake Charles, we had several instances of that and had to pass an ordinance that if we found someone, the person had to spend the night in jail. Whoa. Okay, yeah. so the notion of Joe Pesci running around with a gun and a bag of money is not is nowhere near the reality of this business. No, not at all. That's that's good to hear. I feel I feel much better about it. Well, to show you, Wall Street would never permit that either. Yeah, very excellent point. Mm -hmm. Their money anywhere or write reports if there was any inference of that. We we did when we got started. One of the people who owned some shares in this spot that we bought, uh, his uncle uh, had a, a questionable interest. And before we could, before Solomon Brothers would do business with us, we had to buy that guy out. Mm, okay. Um, so serious due diligence going on and above board? Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. So you, you mentioned the DeBartolo family, kind of a big deal. You have any interesting stories working with them? Yeah, Eddie DeBartolo Sr. Uh, was uh, the owner of Louisiana Downs, which owned okay. the racetrack there. And he had access to a license if he wanted it in Louisiana, because the licenses were very limited as to they could issue only 15 licenses. Okay. Uh, that's what the statute said. And we had uh, were introduced to him and he came and we talked with him several times. And he, uh, he said that he would be, Louisiana Downs would be our partner. In other words, uh, and he owns Louisiana Downs, which, which worked out fine. And we were able to get the license. Um, Eddie DeBartolo Jr. Uh, at the time owned the, the San Francisco 49ers. And while I did meet him several times at their headquarters, uh, he told me he, he couldn't be involved in our business at all uh, because of the fact that um, he, he, he couldn't get the approval of the National Football League. Right. Mm -hmm. They frown on being associated with gambling as, as an owner of a franchise? At that time, subsequent to the fact that, that we bought out Louisiana Downs from their interest. 
that we owned 100 percent. Okay. I, I read with the, that Eddie DeBartolo had been accused of uh, going to the governor uh, to get another license uh, for a casino and paid him four hundred thousand dollars. Oh. Order to get it. And not only did they have Eddie DeBartolo on tape, they had his fingerprints on the money uh, that he got. But we had absolutely no relationship with him at yeah. all. So, okay. So this is, you go back to, it is it is seriously regulatory. Some shady business was attempted and got caught and right. ended up, well, I mean, what, what were the, what are the repercussions of getting caught doing something like that? Uh, he, uh, he went to jail for a year or something, I think. Okay. Yep. Okay. Jail, not a fun place to go. No, I'm sure not. Right. I don't want to find out. No. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of, I wanted to tell you about the Florida. Uh, you know, we own this racetrack. Yeah. Uh, and in we seven track, a whole a number of racetracks in Florida, mostly dog tracks. But in our state, uh, in in uh, we were Pompano is in Broward County, and there were four casinos in Broward, uh, four uh, one horse track, in three dog tracks, and in Miami Dade had three, had Gulfstream, which is a horse track, mm -hmm. and, and a couple of um, uh, dog tracks as well. And we uh, formed a group informally uh, to consider whether we would try to change the constitution uh, mm -hmm. of Florida to permit uh, uh, a casino gambling in Florida. And so what we did was we put together a proposal uh, for the consideration uh, in, in all, early uh, 05 uh, to go for a vote uh, of the public, the state. But what it was was only Broward and Dade were asking. In hmm. other words, those two counties that the rest of the state would not be involved, but the money that would be paid to the state uh, would be distributed statewide for use in 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 uh, education. Okay. Okay. Uh, we asked Palm Beach County to join us in the operation, but because they have a major dog track. Okay. Major dog track in Palm Beach, and they said we didn't have a chance of getting. They checked with their lobbyists. And they didn't have a chance of, of getting it approved. What's the what's the vote requirement for passing a constitutional a state constitutional amendment? Today it's sixty percent because when we passed it, uh, we also had another amendment to change the uh, requirement to sixty <laughs> percent. And, the, and yeah. the reason for that is that um, when when we what what we did was. Uh, we got the, and you have to go through the Supreme Court of Florida to, to get the approval to put it on a ballot and that mm. kind of, which is, which is what we did. And um, we put up, there were, so there were seven participants and we put up a total of $25 million to do the, uh, to, to, to do the constitutional amendment of which my company put up uh, money for two of the other companies on a promissory note that was hmm. supposed to be repaid and ultimately was repaid. Was repaid, all right. But, but I question, well, because we were successful uh, in doing it. But uh, we, we uh, I was able to, when we were looking how we were going to do the lobbying in the public relations, I was put in touch with a guy who was on the cabinet, a CPA, Jim Horn. Nice. Uh, who was a successful accountant. And he was the uh, education secretary. And he was a buddy of um, Jeb Bush. And so he was on the cabinet. Okay. And I had a meeting with him and I made a deal with him that he would leave the cabinet. He would become our spokesman you couldn't get a better spokesman 
Yeah, uh, the, the, yeah. With his credentials mm -hmm. all around the state, and we would pay him a half a million dollars. This is all above board. I pay him a half a million dollars, uh, and and whether we were successful or not, mm -hmm. that was the fee. And we had to put it up in escrow with his lawyers, which is what we did. Uh, and he left it, he took out so much a month and eventually he got it and became our lobbyist again, because okay. he was successful, at least for us, he was uh, our lobbyist. Well, cause he, his pitch was, he was overseeing education in Florida, right? And he was gonna what? get benefit from the tax revenue associated with that? The education yeah. would, and, and why we should do it. Yeah. And, and, and so, and we came up with the whole program, TV and PR, and as I said, as part of the $25 million, that's what we spent the money on. And so we had the, the vote uh, in, uh, oh, and the other thing of the rule was that if we were successful, Broward and Dave each had to have their own election as well. So it was a state vote, and then it was a county vote of hmm. the two uh, counties. Uh, that that participated uh, with us. Uh, as it turned out, we were very concerned about the vote uh, because that was in 04, but it was right after the Bush Gore thing with the county. Right. Mm -hmm. in, in our county, in, 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 in Broward, in Palm Beach County. The hanging chads. Mm -hmm. the hanging chads. So what we did was we hired law firms to go to what a uh, watch the counting in in all the important counties in the voting. Our our most important county was Broward because we knew that if we could pass it constitutionally, we could get the approval. Yeah, because you have four sites to go after. No, no, no. The site, no. Excuse me. These were two existing sites. That yeah. That, from what uh, I remember, was it three dog tracks and one a horse track? Mm -hmm. And in and in Dade, it was kind of the same thing too, and um, so so what we did uh, was uh, Broward had it's they had the vote, and we were all together. I have a picture in my house here <laughs> of, of everyone watching on TV and the voting, and what happened was Broward uh, had set up. Uh, absentee ballots in one precinct, in a separate precinct, which wasn't with the name of a precinct. But once it got so many votes, uh, it, it it went to back to zero and got counted again. They didn't they didn't do it on purpose, but they figured they a, a precinct wasn't going to get more than so many total votes. Mm, okay. And what happened was. Uh, the absentee votes exceeded what the total was. Oh, so, wow. So that it went back to Broward. And one of our attorneys noticed that and saw what was happening and spoke with them on the right there, and they changed it. They changed it to make it un unlimited voting for that particular precinct. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have to go back to zero. And we won the state vote by 50.1%. Whoa, okay, so that was kind of a big deal. <laughs> and, then, and then we went to, the, to Broward County uh, and we got like 66% vote. We knew Broward would. Yeah. Dade County, uh, Jeb Bush, who was governor was anti-gaming. Mm. And at the time uh, he was very unhappy that his education secretary had gone, had left the cabinet and, and was working for us. And when I met with him uh, to talk about the tax rate, because he was very influential there and the Republicans were in control of both the Senate and the House uh, at the time and still are, uh, except the Senate was more favorable for the gaming than the House was. Okay. And, but I went to see Jeb Bush Oh, and the tax rate, excuse me, had to be set by the legislature. Hmm. And I went to see him and he said, Alan, he said, you may have beat me at the polls. He said, but I'm going to set the tax rate so high that you're not going to make any money. 
So the tax rate was set at 50% of gross revenue. I mean, again, of uh, the net. Yeah. And, and we were competing against a, 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 a Indian tribe, like right next door, who wasn't paying much at all. Yeah. At uh, and so uh, we, it passed on that basis and it passed with the legislature. So the last thing that I was hired to do was to make sure that the tax rate went down. Yeah. <laughs> and what I did was with, with the lobbyist, I went and visited and we spent a lot of time with the legislature. Oh, we had a change of governor. Uh, Jeb had left and Charlie Chris came in. Oh, let me back up a little also. Dade County got it defeated because mm. uh, Marco Rubio, who was the Speaker of the House, and also um, Jeb Bush were both from Dade County. Okay. And, went, and on the basis of the vote, Dade County did not uh, get permission to open up a casino. Was it close at least, do you remember? No. Okay. It wasn't, but um, they could come back in either two or three years and, and have another vote. Two or three years, Jeb Bush wasn't governor. He was off doing something else. And Marco mm -hmm. Rubio was doing something else also. So uh, Dade went and got it passed. Nice. Uh, for the, so that they came in, uh, in into the group. But uh, what was paid was um, we got, uh, we, we lobbied uh, the Senate, as I said, the, the Senate always said that they would look favorably on it in the House. And I hired another lobbyist uh, to help Jim Horn. This lobbyist became head of the Republican Party the year after it was approved. So I was certainly in the right place. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, getting it done, and we got it done. The tax rate was reduced to 35% of gross. So we were doing net uh, $150 million of net revenue. So wow. we're thinking about saving 15% off the top. Yeah. So considerable difference. So you did go ahead with opening the casinos at the 50% tax rate. We didn't know what the tax rate was going to be. Oh, okay. So you were making that investment and then... Mm -hmm. and, and Bernie said, oh, we're going to get the approval. Let's start building the casino. So, so we'll get the start. <laughs> I like that move. Right. Yeah. So, so we'll get a head start on everyone. And is it still at 35% today or has it continued to go down? It's 30. Oh, it never goes down. <laughs> Well, if you look around to the various states in the tax that they're paying, 35% is right in the middle of what other states are charging. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, you know, some states are 40% uh, or 45%. But so that, that project, I know what it was, cost us $175 million to build. Okay. And then, I mean, still, despite that tax rate afterwards, very cash flow positive. And oh, oh, yeah. No. Yeah. And we're competing against the tribe, but the casino does very well. Probably the most successful casino the company has today. Oh, wow. So that was well worth the effort to get everything passed. And, mm -hmm. and it has another 100 acres of property that they're going to develop. Uh, into housing, into shopping centers, and that kind of thing. Very cool. Very cool. So, well, any other, any other stories you wanted to tell today? I love just hearing these stories. Oh, with uh, with 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 Lady Luck. Uh, Lady Luck was a public company, and they had properties in Natchez, Lula, Mississippi, and the owner. Uh, you know, it's a public company, and the owner. Uh, the, the majority owner had a casino in downtown Las Vegas called Lady Luck. Okay. And uh, we were happy in, in Mark, we were happy to buy the three or four casinos that they had, which we did, but he insisted that we personally buy his casino in downtown Las Vegas. 
Why is uh, that? Because he didn't want to own it anymore. Oh, okay, but easy answer. No. And yeah, it wasn't. I don't. It wasn't making much money, if any. And and, and we went ahead and did that. And um, and we had no business being in Las Vegas because that wasn't our business. I mean, we we had hotels, we had entertainment, but still, we couldn't weren't interested in competing against the large. Uh, casinos in Las Vegas mm -hmm. didn't do that, and I and I made a deal uh, with the guy who worked for me uh, that if he wanted uh, a bonus this year, he had to get my wife Shirley uh, back on the strip, so that she didn't <laughs> have to stay in downtown Las Vegas. <laughs> That's a good good move on your part, <laughs> yeah. which, which is what he did, and he got it, and he got his bonus. Awesome. Yeah. For those who have not been to downtown Vegas versus the Strip, you want to be on the Strip. Downtown's fun and all. It's great to go down there for a little bit, get the $2 yeah. margaritas. But And they're doing good things down there. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I think, all the pleasant, you know, we own, we tried for other opportunities that we were beaten out or didn't get for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but, uh, Overall, the company was very successful. Well, that's an amazing career. I mean, starting as an accountant, getting your CPA, moving into law, and then doing tax law, and finding yourself in the casino world, and then developing properties, and dealing with legislation, and getting things built, and building a public company. That's that's an amazing career. Yeah. Today, um, when I retired, uh, one of the prince, one of the guys who worked for me, uh, left the company as well. And a couple of years later, was offered an opportunity uh, to come in and manage uh, a couple of casinos uh, in um, in Mississippi. Uh, there were a couple of casinos uh, that were going bankrupt, and the banks in New York owned them, and they couldn't own them and they couldn't manage them. So they were looking for people that they could trust. Okay. And and uh, uh, he called me and said, Alan, I got a great deal for us. And I said, you know, I'm not, I'm retired. He said, well, let me explain to you what the deal is. And he did. And so we bought, we managed, we bought and managed two casinos uh, in, in Mississippi. And um, th that, that were, were unsuccessful, but we were able to, bring it back to at least a, a manageable uh, idea. But, but they, the deal was we would manage the property, we would get a fee, and we would own them as far as the state was concerned. Oh, okay. And, and, and the state knew about this. But because of our reputation in the state, they knew who they were. And also with the bankers, incidentally, they knew who we were, and they were happy to do, and they had an option to buy us out at a predetermined price at any time they wanted and cancel the management agreement, which happened a couple of years later. Uh, and so we managed them for a couple of years and they found a buyer and they sold them and we got money. Okay. At that time, uh, there were two other casinos uh, that had problems, one in Louisiana and one in Mississippi, both of which had been owned by my company, Isla Capri and had been sold and had been run down. Mm. And, and so we came in, in management, and in, in today with two other guys, we, we bought the one casino in Mississippi and someone else bought the casino in Louisiana. And we bought another casino that no one else wanted uh, in Mississippi. So we have two casinos in Mississippi uh, that we own, one in uh, Tunica, Mississippi, in Vicksburg, which was the old aisle uh, there. And, uh, and they're doing very well. Uh, I think the, uh, the fact of the, uh, uh, of the problems of the pandemic has been very favorable for us because people can't go out. We, the casinos were closed for a couple of months. Okay. And okay. during that month, we redid our floor we knew that we'd be limited in terms of what we could do in terms of tables and space. And again, slot machines, 
and brought in new slot machines. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were permitted to open uh, the both casinos are very successful now. Uh, a lot of our customers are over the age of 60 years, but they haven't come back. Who have come back are people who have never visited our casinos before. Oh, interesting. Who, who are younger and they don't want to stay at home. They have some extra cash mm -hmm. and they're getting some cash from the federal government and, they, and they're coming to, to the casino. And one of the interesting stories is uh, that uh, many of several of the uh, people uh, who actually uh, uh, the manufacturers have progressives so that if you buy a, a machine, they will put put aside uh, money uh, for someone who happens to hit the hit the jackpot. Oh, OK. So it's sort of an insurance policy behind. No, no, they actually no, n not for us. This is their jackpot. In other words, we, we they, they're doing it uh, while it's in our place and we're making the money. If there's a big jackpot, they have to pay it off. So they, <laughs> that's you no, know, but, but they're taking that a little bit out of the money that we pay them. Right. Yeah. And they in uh, IGT is one of the largest manufacturers in in they have wherever they have casinos, they have progressives. So you can hit the casino, you can hit the jackpot wherever it is, and it keeps building up. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. It's, it's sort of like this, like a lotto number where the... And so in, um, yeah, that, in, in Tunica, a couple months after we reopened, someone uh, hit the, the jackpot for 2.8 million uh, based upon a 25 cent machine. Wow. And they, we didn't, it, it, it's no one's business who owned it, except that it came from our casino. Right, yeah. <laughs> the manufacturer paid for it. And um, which they do, in many of the casinos do that, and the manufacturers. And so, it, but it, it's really helped us from a PR standpoint. Yeah, I was gonna say that's a that's on the news. You're you're definitely marketing that winner, that jackpot. Yeah, we actually that that casino is called uh, uh, Fitzgerald's, uh, and our slogan is "Luck lives here." Ah, uh, there we go. I like that. And so, and so, so we've had a lot of business in there. So mm -hmm. you guys, uh, it sounds like in some regards you became a casino turnaround house. You were hired to turn. Yes. Forgive my ignorance. I always assumed once you could get the casino up and running, the house always wins. You got money coming in. It's sort of a simple business. So what, when you go into a place that's gone sideways, what did they do wrong? And what do you fix up to make it profitable again? Well, several things. Number one is maybe they're overstaffed. Okay. Too many employees. So you have to cover back. The other thing is we have a players club that we have. And so you get points that you build up and you get free play. Okay. And in Mississippi, uh, we, we give out a lot of free play. Uh, so, and, and that doesn't count on any money we have to pay the state. So. Oh, okay. And so that's that's made a big difference uh, in, in the state. Uh, so. And for Mississippi generally, yeah. Yeah, so cleaning up, cleaning up operations, a bit of a different customer uh, experience with you. And also marketing. We, we send out offers. Uh, I'm, I'm on the list of the two casinos. <laughs> you get the emails in the mail today? <laughs> oh, you get emails, you get bonuses. We have hotels uh, that, that we re refurbished and, and you can stay at the hotels and in the food while you can't do uh, meals anymore. Uh, we do, uh, do you know what Fuddruckers is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have a Fuddruckers in Tunica plus a pizza place, which is fine. That's what people want to eat. And, and, and they're very conscious of the employees. And, and we have them talking to the, uh, to the people and at, answering questions. People love to go to our casinos. So providing a better customer experience, actually marketing. It's not a, if we build it, they will come type, type deal. Not, not at all. Not at all. And, uh, and, and also the payout. In other words, 
uh, of the switch in 90 something percent of the business is slot machines. But we return, and most of these casinos do also, it depends upon the state, somewhere between seven and 8%. So, w w excuse me, we're, we're returning 92% to the customer. Okay. Because what we're interested in doing is someone coming, having a good time, maybe having a drink, saying, wow, you know, I lost a couple hundred dollars, but, but this is good, and I want to come back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, whatever. It was an expensive Jack and Coke, and then you're fine with it because you get the free drink. Mm -hmm. Especially from a safety measure. We have people going around cleaning the machines and someone leaves. So, Oh, and you have to have a mask. Okay. Mm -hmm. But when people come in, they see them going around cleaning the machines. They know that they're in a safe place. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's an amazing career run. Like I said, accountant to lawyer to tax attorney to really entrepreneur and full on right. executive building huge casinos and building a casino empire, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been a great conversation. Um, I would like to ask, you know, you obviously did a lot in your career. You learned a lot. Um, any career advice you could give for accountants who might want to do something beyond accounting and move into finance or even anything bigger than that? Were there key learnings you had with transitioning from accounting to those areas? I think accountants have a big benefit uh, because they do have an accounting background. Mm -hmm. There's so many people who just don't understand what numbers are and how to use them and that type of thing. And I think having an accounting degree or being in accounting you you are way ahead in terms of competing, whether it's for a job as an accountant or whether or not it's a business and you're going into whether it's marketing. Everything has numbers involved. Yeah. Even though you have doing numbers for marketing, you still have people. You have to work uh, through through the numbers and what makes sense and what type of office you can get. And accounting is, is looks across the whole industry. Oh, you know what the hard work makes in Florida from a profit standpoint? It's almost a billion dollars a year of EBITDA. Whoa. You know, and, and that's the other thing. People don't understand what EBITDA is and, and it, it, it accountants. So if they study and they really take good accounting courses, Mm -hmm. All sorts of opportunities are available. As a matter of fact, and they can be investment bankers. I think the Jim Murren, who was the head of MGM, started in account. So he started in accounting. So many people uh, have an accounting background. Yeah, I don't. I don't think accountants realize how versatile it is, and how you can make a career pivot, and how. It applicable it is to other things. I, I know there are multiple politicians who are CPAs and these are in the House and the Senate. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I love to hear that as the former accountant and with the show that is helping accountants get career advice. And yeah, the knowing the numbers helps with every other aspect of business. Right. Yeah. Well, Alan, thank you so much for taking the time today. I really, I really appreciate it. Um, okay. I'm going to let you get back to living the retired life there in Boca. Things look very nice with that. I see some palm trees behind you. You got a pool. Good to go. Oh, okay. Oh, you, uh, oh, you do see the pool, right? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs>